relationship and, and bring the wines into South Africa. So this is basically the first of our, what we're calling uh, tasteners that we're trying to put on. And we're trying to leverage off all of our privileged relationships around the world, specifically in Europe and in South Africa. So this is the first of them um, involving Barbara from Sandroni and obviously Caroline, a good friend and customer down in Cape Town. And hopefully as many of you as possible can join us for the next two, which will involve Remington Norman and uh, Guillaume Dangeville in Burgundy. And then the one after that, we, we um, will be chatting to Benoit Margay and then Paul Gerber from, uh, from Colmont. So just in terms of how it's gonna work, it's pretty simple. Um, Barbara is gonna give us a fantastic presentation of the winery, the philosophy um, over the next sort of 30, 40 minutes. So if you, haven't, if you haven't got a glass of wine in front of you, hopefully it is a, is a glass of Sandroni. If it's not, make it Italian at the very least. Um, so we'll have fun uh, listening to Barbara. And then when we finish with that, we'll, as I say, be 30, 40 minutes, we'll um, do a bit of questions and answers with, uh, with Caroline and uh, Barbara. And, and then I'll also just keep track of some of the questions that may come through. And then we hopefully will be finished at around six o'clock. So I hope it all works out. Um, drink up and enjoy. And um, I'm going to hand over to, to Barbara. So we're just going to do the little connection. So enjoy it. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Derek. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Derek, for this nice presentation. As you said, you know, I've never been uh, to South Africa, but, you know, this is an amazing uh, way to be closer to you all. So I'm very emotional. I feel so emotional right now as I've been on so many of these presentations, of course, with uh, friends, customers in front, and especially, you know, with a glass of wine in front. Um, not easy, um, but, you know, uh, I wanted to uh, to do that. Uh, and in fact, I put so much uh, um, pressure and stress on, on Christine in order to have this moment with you all to be closer, to bring some uh, sunshine um, to all of us. Uh, you know, we are living at this uh, really surreal period of time, something that I never thought that to live into. And also my dad, who actually is uh, 73, so he saw more than me. Uh, but Something like that is very, very unique, and I hope it's going to stay, you know, uh, unique in that sense. So, yeah, well, tonight or this afternoon, because, uh, you know, what is uh, nice is uh, finally, uh, I mean, I'm talking to you all, and we are absolutely in the same time zone, as most of the time, uh, you know, I, I talk to my friends and customers uh, around the world, so we confused between good day, good night, uh, good afternoon, but with you anyway, at least uh, we, we are in the same time zone. Uh, not the, the season, I mean, uh, we, we are um, uh, in the middle of our spring time, uh, you are approaching, uh, uh, I mean, you are in the middle of, of autumn, so um, at least, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to take you, uh, how can I say, to dinner time anyway, so at least uh, if you have some wine from uh, from our winery, and as the director was saying, anyway, if not, it doesn't matter anyway, uh, I hope you can keep drinking um, Italy tonight or Italian wines, otherwise it doesn't matter. Anything you like, uh, it's, uh, it's super fine. So, um, well, you know, um, well, Tonight I'm happy to introduce you the, the story of my family, which is a very uh, simple story uh, based uh, on a strong passion for what we do, uh, making wine um, from this incredible uh, Kona paradise, uh, uh, which is uh, Langari, uh, where we got the uh, an incredible gift from the sky. Anyway, we made great varietals, uh, red, white, at the end, Dolcetto, uh, Barbera, and Nebbiolo. At the end, uh, Nebbiolo into our region where we are into. Anyway, it's uh, a broader white. So uh, I brought this um, uh, 
uh, only way I said this presentation, and I'd like to go through some slides in order to show you also some nice pictures uh, of the winery, uh, of our vineyards, uh, and also you know, a couple of maps in order to tell you precisely where we are basing to. Um, for the one especially never been here before. And um, and also, you know, this is a, like a sort of invitation to you all as soon as everything is going to be over to, you know, jump on the first flight, land to Milan, and then pick up your car and drive down into the region. So we are all here waiting for you with our open arms. Um, so you have seen the, the video. I wanted to, you know, um, welcome everybody with some nice images uh, from, uh, from the winery, from the region. Um, and, um, and now, oops, hold on. I'm not so no, I don't uh, I that person. Okay. Christopher, I need your help. I'm sorry everybody, but I can uh, move to the next slide. Do you know okay. the reason why? Oh my god, I'm sorry. What's the um... problem? Let me do again. Stop sharing. Okay. Share my screen with you. Okay, let me try this one. Try this one, share. Okay. But it doesn't move. Okay, let me try the other one, maybe. Sorry about that. you waiting for me. Sure. I mean, it worked before. It's because the poor connection. Okay, okay, here we are. This is the second slide. Okay, okay, okay. I'm here glad it's working. Sorry, brother. <laughs> Sorry for making you wait. Anyway, so. Talking now, yeah. and she's showing an introductory video. Okay. And yeah, uh, oh, luckily, I, they told me to click myself out so that they can't see me. Okay. I can hear someone talking. Uh, is it okay? Or can you hear me? Everybody hearing me? Hi, Derek. We Hello? can hear you fine, Barbara. Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, I was hearing some people talking and I wasn't sure. I thought uh, you got me frozen. So, okay. Good. You know, I, I go ahead, and uh, if you if you think there are some uh, technical issues, uh, just uh, stop me, okay? Or you okay. can send me a message. Okay, right. So as I was saying before, anyway, you know, uh, I'm here uh, in order to bring you some sunshine and uh, talk to you about the star of my family. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, 50 plus harvests. Uh, I'm talking about the four, 40 years of wine making, so I want to use numbers in order to help you to memorize, you know, all the important steps that we went through. So I'm also going to talk to you about three local uh, grape varietals uh, of the region, so Nebbiolo, Barbera, and Dolcetto. We're talking about two territories uh, together, and um, so Lange and Roero. Uh, and the two stories together are going to tell the story of our five red wines. Um, and I, I, I mean, I hope that some of you already had tasted our wines, and if not, it will be pretty soon, as we are working hard right now to organize uh, uh, achievement anyway, as soon as, um, uh, you know, lockdown is going to be a little bit uh, less locked down anyway. So, uh, well, let me first uh, introduce you uh, the protagonist of everything, uh, of this uh, magnificent story, which is my, um, my dad. As you can see from the picture, everything really started from, from him. And uh, so that's why I said the 50 plus harvest is, uh, 
you know, my dad is 73, um, actually 73 in, in February, and uh, I was chatting uh, uh, with uh, Caroline before, you know, we had uh, this incredible chance to be able to go out for dinner in a local restaurant here in Alba, to be all together, uh, along with my kids. Uh, my kids uh, are 21 and 19. Uh, they were born in, uh, in January, uh, two, year, two, days, two years and two days apart. As Alicia was born on, um, on January 19th and on January 17th. So we decided to combine all the celebrations together and uh, have, you know, um, all together. So the, 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 the week after, I had to leave for Australia uh, on, on a business trip, and I had this incredible chance. Uh, I mean, you know, I was really kissed by the angels, I don't know, uh, to be able to come back from Australia on Saturday, Saturday the 7th. And the lockdown here in Italy started precisely the day after, anyway, on Sunday the 8th. Uh, you know, at that time, uh, I really didn't know what I was going through. And right now, after two and a half months, uh, you know, I feel extremely, simply blessed. Anyway, sorry about talking about my personal experience, but, you know, I will never forget about that. So then I'm um, also going to talk about the 40 years, uh, so four decades. This is uh, uh, this is the new winery. Uh, it's uh, 20 years old. Before this uh, beautiful location, in a way, my dad was making wine in the garage at the house. But later on, I'm going to explain you. And uh, and here we, we talk about uh, 40 years together, as everything uh, started in uh, 1977 when my dad had this incredible chance to buy his uh, first vineyard. Uh, from a very majestic um, hillside in Barolo. Anubi, that's the name of the hill, but this is the name of the subway. So my dad uh, was born in, uh, in the village of uh, La Morra uh, from a family of carpenters and uh, nothing to do with wine. Um, my grandpa, his dad, decided to move from the village of La Morra down to Barolo in order to implement their business, its business, uh, sorry. Um, and my dad had never been so much interested in being a carpenter. So, so it was an incredible chance uh, to uh, get to work at Giacomo Borgogno, one of the most historical winery in the, in the center of the village. Very traditional, very careful, attentive about uh, Nebbiolo grapes and so Barolo wine. Then he got another incredible chance uh, to be cellar master of Marchese Barolo. But, um, in the 1970, he had an incredible responsibility anyway, because he was uh, uh, in charge of uh, making the wine. At that time, I'm talking about uh, Marchese Barolo in terms of production, he was uh, making more than one million bottles of Barolo, plus other red wines, white wine, white wines, uh, sparkling. So, uh, it, and he was in charge of improving the quality of, of the wine, the final wine. So, my dad said probably we need to do something different. So the quality must absolutely start, I mean, in the vineyard. So, so that's why he wanted to start looking around in order to be able to buy his own vineyard and making his own wine. And it happened in 1978. 78 was quite a significant vintage for uh, Barolo. And, uh, and the resulting wine was pretty good. The vineyard was very small, was like a, a, a stamp for a postcard, less than uh, an actor. Uh, but it was working hard in order to really express uh, uh, all his passion at the end, into the grapes, at the end, into the wine. And um, <clears throat> um, um, it, the, the, the that for this wine was a thousand five hundred bottles, but it was a little bit in trouble because he didn't know what to do with this huge amount of bottles. Anyway, okay, the wine was good, but 
uh, you know, uh, the, the the room and the house wasn't so big. So he joined a group uh, called Piccoli Produttori, means little makers, who are actually like pioneers, like my dad anyway, with so many dreams, uh, but not with a precise idea of what to do uh, next. So they were making great wines, but they didn't have uh, the right uh, customers anyway, so they decided to join together uh, money and uh, and uh, thought to go to Verona to the Vinitli wine fair to promote their wines. So they met uh, an American broker who actually understood uh, um, their philosophy and was able to export everything in the United States. So that's why in 1981 my dad was able to export his wine over there. Then in 18, 1985, something happened. As you see, you know, the two labels. Uh, the first one, 1978, and white, very traditional with so many information on. And 1985, extremely simplified. So uh, that was the moment to take a chance anyway, and also to change a little bit uh, uh, in order to um, stand out anyway. So why not uh, um, revolut or revamp uh, also the label of the most important wine, the Canui Bosque, Supervolo, with three main uh, information on. So the name of the winery, the name of the wine, and the vintage, all you need to know. So then, um, as you can see, in, uh, you know, at the end of the 80s, uh, uh, also, some wine critics uh, realized about the quality of the wines of my dad. So, giving also some, uh, uh, I mean, rates, uh, comments, uh, and uh, and also the first articles on on main uh, wine newspaper. And in uh, 1995, uh, Luca and I we. We were able to join the family. Luca actually is not my brother. I'm only surprised that Luca is my dad's youngest brother. Um, uh, two brothers are 21 years apart from each other, and Luca and I are, we are only uh, three years. So Luca um, went to the Oenological School in Alba, and uh, and right now is in charge of uh, of the quality of the grapes uh, farming. Then, uh, step by step, anyway, you know, we we took so many important decisions in order to uh, make our wines so special. So my dad heard about uh, this incredible historical hillside in Roero um, called Val Maggiore where actually was all cultivated with Nebbiolo grapes and making an extraordinary uh, Nebbiolo wine. So he decided to go there in order to start talking to some uh, farmers in order to understand how to be able to, you know, maybe to first rent, lease, and then buy or so vineyards there. In the end, it happened in 1994, when we were able to acquire from 28 different owners three actors in Valmajora inside, which is in Roero. In 1999, uh, finally, we were able to move in the new facility. Uh, so we bought a, a small piece of land uh, in the village of Barolo in a sort of quite, quite flat uh, position the food of the new baskets in order to build the new nest for our wines. Because before then, all the wines were simply made in the garage of the house. So that's why we've always been considered as a garagist. With this new facility, we also wanted to give life to an important project, which is the library stock. And uh, the proper name actually is a CB that uh, it's uh, it's Latin uh, and it has an incredible incredible meaning for all of us. But I'm going to catch up on that later on. And then uh, in 2010, 2011, two important vineyards uh, um, a part of uh, of our family. Let's say it this way. Uh, in 2010, actually, Baudana in Serra Lunga d'Alba, and 2011, Villero in uh, in the village of uh, Castiglione Falletto. Both, 
uh, vineyards are right now part of Barolo Levigne. And then, you know, um, time flies, uh, kids uh, growing up and becoming older. <laughs> so in 2017, you, you can see my two kids, Alessia on the left and Stefano is the boy on the right and something extremely important happened uh, at um, the family um, in the family as uh, my dad wanted to uh, pay tribute to the new family uh, generation simply simply say simply offering uh, his most important wine Barolo Canui Bosques, the blue label that I showed you before, into Aleste. So this wine has been simply uh, rebranded and it's going to bring uh, forever their nicknames. So if you put together the two nicknames of the two kids, Ale, Alessia, Ste, Stefano, together, you have the family word Aleste. And in 2018, uh, we were able to celebrate our 40th anniversary as uh, 1978 2018. So, an important step uh, for, uh, for my dad, uh, for everybody, I have to say. In 2019, actually, uh, end of 2019, beginning of 2020, we're going to launch uh, a new, uh, new baby, a new Barolo called. Parolo Vitali, and later on I'm going to show you the because uh, soon is also coming to South Africa. So that's why uh, you understand that uh, the, the reason uh, why I wanted to you know, talk about numbers uh, in order to help you memorize uh, everything. So we were talking about three great uh, varieties. So, and the three octonous grape varieties from the region are Nebbiolo, Barbera, and Dottito. And, yeah, and those are the ones giving birth to uh, our five red wines. So from uh, Dolcetto, you see at the top, anyway, the logo of the label. Uh, we have our Dolcetto d'Alba. And then uh, from Barbera, we make uh, a Barbera d'Alba wine. And the Nebbiolo actually uh, gives us uh, three big brothers. So we are talking about uh, Balmaggiore, which is the Nebbiolo d'Alba from Roero, uh, Barolo Levigne, which is the one with the red label, and Barolo Canui Boschis, as you probably know this wine for, with that name, slash Aleste. This is a new name of Rivoskis. So five uh, red wines. Uh, and, uh, you know, what is uh, beautiful is the fact that uh, from the small concentration of uh, labels like that, you have this uh, incredible, in, very uh, enormous expression of, uh, of the region. And I said that, especially for the one already been here, that they know precisely what I'm talking about. Uh, the region is all, not, so, uh, not so big, but so diverse, I say it this way. And uh, even the, the, the same grape varietal, depending on the region where it comes from, the vineyards, the sun exposure, the elevation, the type of soil, the end works in a different way. So let's uh, talk about uh, the two regions. As uh, I hope, uh, yeah, let me uh, show you first uh, the, the map. So we are, of course, uh, in Italy, and uh, you see from the map uh, the blue region uh, in the northwest part of Italy. That's, uh, that's Piemont. And when we talk about uh, our two wine uh, district, so we have Roero and Langa, they are really. Uh, based in the south. Um, so the main city of, of the region is Alba. Alba is crossed by a river called Anaro, able to divide the, the two um, areas. So into the, into the north, on the left bank of the river uh, Anaro, we have Roero, and into the south, right bank, we have Langa. So the two regions are, as you can see, next to each other anyway, but they are so, so different because of the composition 
of, of the soil. So Roero is uh, absolutely sandy. Uh, it's also defined as uh, the kingdom, the, um, yeah, the kingdom of, uh, of the Arnaise, the only white varietal from the area. But historically, in Roero, there have always been two important sites for Nebbiolo. Um, Okeki and Balmagione. Let me go back to the other slide. So, you know, we have two pictures next to each other. And I'm sure you can also see uh, uh, how different the morphology of the hills uh, are from these uh, two districts. So in Roero, uh, hills are really steep and slow. Um, our vineyard is 65, 70% steep, so it's really tough to work there. Uh, talking about Langa, the eels are absolutely more feminine, more gentle, more round. And as I was saying, also the composition of the soil in a way, Roero is a compact type of sand, uh, so it's quite poor, there's not so much uh, minerality at the end into the soil. It's also poor in terms of uh, humidity. That's why the grapes are ripe normally uh, quite in advance, Cooper Langa, talking about Nebbiolo, we talk about end of September, beginning of October. Uh, talking about Langa, we have, we have a much more clay in limestone, so also the harvest that happens and normally, you know, around the second, third, week of October. Okay, so we, we have seen already this map. If there's something not clear anyway, please uh, uh, feel free to, to stop me. I know that uh, at the end we're going to collect uh, all the questions, uh, but anyway, just, uh, just let me know. Um, so the winery is uh, located in, uh, in Barolo, in the heart of uh, Langa, but absolutely in Barolo district. Barolo district is composed by 11 little villages. And, uh, and we have, uh, you know, vineyards in so many uh, communes and anyway, uh, villages. So Barolo Canubi Mosque is, uh, is absolutely in the village of Barolo, and we have uh, Vignane, <coughs> in Brolo as well. Merli, it's a little sub-region in the village of Novello, quite high in terms of elevation. Villero in Castiglione Falletto is one bringing so much finesse to the Brolo Levinia because it's a rich sand in the soil. And then Baro, Baudana in Serra Lunga d'Alba, which is quite uh, austere anyway. Over there we have so much clay, limestone. So at the end, uh, the final wine is always quite robust anyway, I would say big shoulders. Uh, we also uh, used to have some vineyards in Monforte d'Alba, uh, in part Barolo Levigne. Uh, since we had this incredible chance in 2010, in 2011, to uh, acquire the two vineyards in, um, in Serra Lunga and in Castiglione, we did immediately uh, those two vineyards in Monforte d'Alba. Um, Roero, uh, the difference, uh, um, it's really the composition of the, of the soil. It's amazing, you know, to have, uh, excuse me, give me just a second to get the drop of water and then later wine. <clears throat> so uh, it's amazing to have the same grape varietal at the end because of the soil expressing in a different way. So over there we have uh, so much finesse and, uh, and elegance. And at the end, most important in a way about everything, <laughs> maybe this should be the first slide, it's, uh, it's a family in a way, as I was saying. So you see my dad, you see uh, me, and then my uncle Luca, and, uh, and the two kids. This, um, this picture must be created anyway, and I uh, hope soon we're going to, you know, to, to make it again. Is uh, uh, my mom that day was away, and also Lucas' son, uh, it was uh, away. But anyway, soon I'm going to introduce them also to you. Okay. 
now you can see my mom, uh, the, the family uh, growing up in a way, becoming bigger and bigger. Uh, also my mom and Giacomo, uh, with some Luca's son, is part of this picture. And this is a nice picture <clears throat> of uh, all of our team is at the end of the harvest uh, or finishing hunting uh, a specific vineyard that we are in uh, in, in Val Maggiore, in Roero. We always organize a sort of picnic as we think that we deserve that. And of course, sharing a glass of wine. Um, very important is uh, I, let me also talk about is um, project. Uh, this project, uh, it's uh, the library stock, as I was uh, telling you before, CB at Pouches. So as soon as we had uh, the chance to build a new facility, we thought it was extremely important to have dedicated rooms uh, at temperature control in order to hold back uh, part of our wines. Uh, mostly I'm talking about uh, the Nebbiolo family. So I'm talking about Valmentore, Barolo Livigne, and right now Barolo Leste. So uh, my dad uh, understood, uh, understood the importance uh, of uh, aging Barolo and giving the time to the wine from Giacomo Borgogno when he was uh, working for, for him. Uh, as he was constantly saying to my dad, uh, don't be in a hurry, don't rush with Barolo, you know, you really need to give the right time. And you will see even uh, uh, maybe the vintage wasn't uh, under the perfect or the lucky star. Uh, you will see that Nene Biolo is going to pay you back in a way, to, to come back. And also with time. And in fact, you know, years ago, uh, I'm talking about uh, 17 years ago, we started holding back a part of the production of approximately uh, 8% at the time, because you also have to consider financially what a huge investment is for us to hold back for a long time this amount of bottles. And, uh, and then, you know, as soon we started releasing those vintages. Uh, it was an incredible enthusiasm, anyway, from uh, all our customers about enjoying finally wines uh, properly aged um, from the producer and, uh, you know, quite mature because I'm talking about 10, 15, uh, and also 20 years old. So uh, we were. Let me say, uh, also one of the first one in, uh, in Barolo uh, embracing this important project. That's why we wanted to give a precise name. And I, you know, the first beginning, I didn't know <laughs> uh, what kind of word or what kind of name given to this project because uh, this project has nothing to do with the Reserva. Uh, has uh, nothing to do with selection, but is uh, really, you know, the same wine, the same bottling. It's uh, our a sort of uh, sacrificing ourselves in a way to hold back uh, a certain amount of bottles and then to release them later on. So I went through my books of Latin and I got this incredible um, sentence uh, pronounced by Plinio. Uh, in Giovane, Pliny the Younger, actually was a philosopher, but he was so much in love with wine. And he got an incredible invitation, a uh, unique chance at that time, to participate to uh, a, a sort of wine dinner, or mostly a dinner, let's say it this way. So he brought some of his wine and he said, Ubi et pouches. Very selfish ish sentence in a way, very strict. Uh, CB means something done for myself and pouch is uh, for my favorite ones. So I always uh, love so much uh, to relate the sentence uh, in this way. So CB is something done for myself, uh, but wine is caring, is happiness. Uh, so it is a project that's been done for uh, the most important grape varietal from the region, uh, Nebbiolo, and the result or the result from these grape varietal, so Barolo wines. 
and also thinking about the future anyway, thinking of my kids. So it's also been done for the future of this family. And uh, for my favorite ones, uh, well, you know, I, I wish I could make everybody happy. But uh, unfortunately, right now, I'm not able to. <laughs> I cannot do it. So let's start from uh, some. That's why we wanted to dedicate this project uh, at the first beginning to uh, our uh, customers' restaurants in order to help them to create uh, uh, their wine list uh, in order to give a chance to our customers to enjoy uh, of these incredible wines uh, right there. Right now, step by step, you know, we're able to increase also the percentage of the amount of bottles that we hold back. We, right now, we are up to 15 moving towards in to 17 percent so you know uh that was a promise as uh i'm really we are really working hard in order to make uh, more and more friends uh, happy and uh, happy and happier um so oh, sorry what i didn't tell you and uh, i hope you can see me as uh, I see myself in a little <laughs> square box. So um, how to identify the bottles coming from the library stock? Simply looking at the label. And you see that, um, I hope you can see it well, but it's also on the slide. There's a seal with the, the name of the project, seed pouches. So if the bottle, Brings is a seal on the top of it, it means that it has spent at least 10 years, you know, uh, in bed, at the winery with us, sleeping, aging, and getting better, of course. So that's the seal, it the defined project. And right now, we, we farm 27 acres, which is a lot, thinking that we really started from scratch. So um, considering also how expensive uh, uh, lands uh, have become uh, in the region, but uh, it was extremely important for us to have the full control on, on our uh, lands. So again, this is um, uh, the map I was showing you in order to let you better understand the difference between Royer and Langa. Let's uh, focus uh, on the, the six uh, communes, uh, villages uh, we are into. So in Barolo, we are uh, five villages, Barolo, Novello, Monforte, I hope you can see them, Serralunga and Castiglione, and King of Royero in the village of Vezza d'Alba, right in Valmentola. Okay, now I think is the time for tasting the wine. I know it's sad, but don't, don't be too sad anyway. I'm sure that, you know, I'm going to, <laughs> um, to uh, how can I say, to, to motivate you to walk down into the cellar tonight and open a bottle of, uh, of wine. So, talking about the fine wines, uh, well, very quickly, you know, we have uh, five different labels. Uh, Dolcetto d'Alba is uh, we normally call Parisian uh, simplicity because it's the most simple wine from, from the region. But uh, we never had to introduce uh, our wine as a simple wine. Maybe easy, easy going with so many different types of uh, food and dishes. Um, main characteristic of Dolcetto is the fact that it's not aging oak, so just in stainless steel for 10 months. So it's the wine really talking about fruit and freshness. Talking about uh, Pera d'Alba along with Bocetto are the two most welcoming wines from the region, very friendly uh, as uh, you don't need, I mean I don't want to find anybody but normally I said that you don't need that to be a great expert and a sommelier in order to uh, be a friend of these wines as uh, there are two wines talking to you because of the fruitiness and the freshness. So Bocetto there's so much uh, red fruit and thinking about uh, uh, the red cherry. And in somehow, you know, also the acidity is so gentle, so soft, that it seems to be also sweet, 
at the end, the wine is not sweet. In Barbera, uh, the main characteristic is the acidity. I mean, the acidity is in your palate, and we also understood how to make this acidity part of the wine and not something predominant. As uh, the vineyards are based uh, in two main villages uh, in the region, in Monforte d'Alba and in Novello, behind rules of elevation, being able to get a special breeze, and also to achieve a perfect ripeness uh, at the end of September or beginning of October. But of course, then the wine needs to stay a little bit longer in oak, at least one year, in French barrels, 500 uh, liters, from actually, you know, a good amount of new oak. I'm talking about 30, 35% of, of new oak. So at the end, uh, the resulting wine, it's uh, a pure uh, pleasure on your palate because it, it's like a beautiful puzzle you know you know the final picture that you have to compose with the, all the little pieces and it's the same for Barbera so you have uh, the oak when it's young uh, overwhelming a little bit uh, uh, the chunkiness of the fruit and you have this incredible fruit red fruit and also spiciness uh, uh, moving ahead or anyway wanted to take over and uh, at the end uh, uh, you have this uh, acidity um, which is uh, you know just a pure caress uh, for for your palate uh, talking about aging the the, the shape, um, doesn't last uh, too long anyway we normally suggest that three four years well, nothing is going to happen up after this period of time to this wine uh, is going to remain absolutely young and fresh but um, losing a little bit the, the fruitiness. Talking about Barbera, I actually uh, love so much time <laughs> and age so well. Um, you know, I mean, 10, 15, um, in some in great vintages uh, like 2017 because of, because of the heat and because Barbera loves so much sunshine and high, and high temperature, actually you can do it also for 20 years without any kind of problem. Talking about uh, um, the Nebbiolo, so you have need to uh, tune yourself in a different music channel as uh, we are moving uh, from uh, Barolo di Stick into Roero, and uh, we are also changing, uh, you know, type of uh, grape varietal. So uh, Nebbiolo, you know how Nebbiolo, what a prima donna Nebbiolo is. So uh, and it's amazing that uh, the same grape varietal in uh, a sandy soil uh, becomes an incredible, gentle, elegant wine with extremely soft, soft tannins. Um, the nose reminds you the little berries uh, from the woods. Uh, I'm talking about the raspberries, the strawberries, uh, the freshness of the acidity of the pomegranate. I don't know how familiar you are with this fruit, but we have so many wild pomegranate trees around and in, uh, in September, October, you know, when the fruit uh, fruits get ready, uh, it, I mean, they break, it, they break in two. And if you have the chance to smell the, the aroma, the sign of uh, the leaf grains uh, is absolutely this wine. So talking about the morphology of this vineyard, as you can see how majestic it is. Uh, it's a beautiful amphitheater from east to west, from uh, I mean, very steep and slow. It's a normally um, 10, two weeks, 10 days, two weeks uh, to go through the harvest uh, because we need to give the time to the grapes uh, to achieve the best ripeness. So there are uh, 142 meters of discrepancy between the bottom to the top, it means a lot, especially in October when it's the time to, grape, to harvest the grapes. Uh, as I said, anyway, this was uh, the vineyard that my dad uh, was able to buy by a, uh, by a chance in the 1990 from 28 different uh, owners, and that so was uh, an incredible gift. So talking about this wine, um, so aging, it's similar to 
Barbera uh, in the sense that it has uh, one year in oak and then one year in bottle before leasing time. But in oak, uh, it's always from second, third year. Never new oak for this wine, otherwise it's uh, overwhelming too much of the finesse of the nose and also of the palate. Um, but no, it's always, uh, I mean, the same capacity, 500 liters of oak. So this wine is a part of the library stock. As you can see, the other bottle, the little bottle in the back, bringing on the top of the label, the little seal, silver pouches. This is a silver because it means six years. So uh, this wine actually um, does, uh, comes from a sandy soil. It's uh, a wine that in somehow uh, is not timeless uh, like Barolo and maybe Barbaresco, uh, he has some limits anyway. So but I'm talking about 30, 40 years. So it's a quite important uh, limit of time. Um, so uh, normally we release this wine after six years. Talking about Barolo Levigne, so uh, get ready to jump over the river Tanroff. So from uh, uh, Valmaggiore hillside, we move down uh, into Barolo district. And right now it's time to talk about our Barolo Levigne, right now composed by four vineyards. As you can see, I mean, uh, we have a Vignane in, uh, in Barolo. Uh, we have Baudana in Serlunga d'Alba, Merli uh, Novello, and Villero in Castiglione Falletto. So, Le Vigne. Le Vigne, uh, what does it mean? Uh, it's an Italian word, the name means the vineyards, and it reflects so much the tradition in making Barolo, as uh, the tradition has always been blending several plots around the, the different villages, uh, different sub-regions, in order to express, uh, you know, all the, the complexity at the end in a soul glass of wine. So we normally compare our Barolo de Livigne to a beautiful bunch of flowers, a bouquet, where you have uh, different fragrances, uh, colors, and nuances, uh, uh, all together. And together they talk uh, how uh, incredible is uh, the expression of this region. We, um, the four vineyards actually are, look, are based uh, in a sort of diagonal way, crossing uh, the, the district of Barolo. So more or less in composition of the soil, I have to say that are quite similar, but what is different is really the elevation. And so it takes a while to go through the, the harvest. And normally we pick grapes uh, middle of October, finishing the end of October, beginning of November. So as I was saying before, as a perfect diagonal, anyway, going through. Uh, so we are switching from 300 meters up to 440, uh, 450, I'm sorry, 450 meters high. And then at the end, Aleste, as you, uh, you already have met in somehow my kids, Alessia and Stefano, my dad is in the center. And uh, this picture is right um, in, uh, in Canubi, Koski's uh, vineyard. At the bottom, actually, you see this uh, bunch of houses, that's the winery. So uh, Aleste is uh, the natural continuity of uh, Luciano first wine, let's say this way, but all of Canui Boskis, because at the end, merely nothing has changed. So um, the blue label, uh, Aleste is going, Barolo is going to be uh, made with the, the same Nebbiolo grapes coming from the same vineyard in Barolo, in Canubi Hill, in Boskis, right? Uh, sub-region made uh, uh, and also farm with the same enthusiasm, with the same philosophy. Uh, nothing has changed. It's just an incredible gesture from, uh, from my dad uh, towards uh, the, new the family new generation. So 
uh, from the vintage of 2013. Uh, this one is going to be or has been renamed into Esther. So yes, uh, as uh, the, the slide says, anyway, iconic wine. As uh, why doing, uh, you know, a special gesture like that? I'm talking about from my dad's side, uh, simply because you know uh, he got the chance to buy this vineyard from the first beginning. Uh, really, by a chance, uh, he never thought that, that this wine. Um, was becoming so much um, appreciated. Uh, so he put really himself in what he was doing. Um, and he keep doing that, I'm sorry. Um, but at a certain point, I think that, uh, you know, uh, as soon you get kids, uh, you know, really the meaning of being uh, parents. And, uh, and soon, anyway, you know, I hope I'll going to have a chance uh, to have some grandkids and I'm sure I will understand uh, the meaning of the of the gesture of my dad. You know, everything uh, happened suddenly because, uh, uh, well, as you know, my, my kids right now are 21 and 19 and my dad uh, 12 years ago wanted to have the entire family around the table my mom and I understood that something was going on in his mind, but we never expected it was something uh, so important in a way, you know. So he said, uh, I want to do something special for um, uh, the tickets. Uh, I want them to uh, be proud of me. And, and I said, you know, more than that, what else? Honestly, what else? And then he said, uh, I want to pay tribute to them um, offering a wine. I said, oh, well, do you have something in mind? Uh, even my my uncle Luca never expected that he was talking about the uh, Kanuri He said, that, you know, I think that family is above everything and uh, Kanuri Voskis is an important site. Uh, I don't want to uh, be uh, unrespectful, but you know, I think that uh, Aleste is the right name for this wine. And so we made it. Oops. And I think that we, yeah, this is the, the video that we prepare for you all. Um, yeah, I see Derek coming, <laughs> appearing again. <laughs> Uh, so if you have any questions uh, or um, something that oh, I wasn't uh, clear about, just uh, let me know. And if you don't mind, now I'm getting a sip of uh, Oberolo and actually I'm drinking some Levinia 15, which is the one that is uh, going to arrive very soon. So if you have also questions about uh, vintages, upcoming vintages, please um, yeah, Barbara, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, that was fantastic. Um, I think some of the connections, uh, it started to get a bit better in the middle in terms of oh. the Italian South African connection. So it's great. Um, and then Barbara, just for your interest, um, because you would have been concentrating on, on talking to us just to give you an update on what some of the friends and customers have been drinking while you've been talking. Um, so we've got Dean who's drinking a, a 2005 Barbera. So quite interesting to see how long it's aged for. He says ah. it's drinking very, very nicely yeah. at 2005. Um, and then there's a 2000 and, uh, 2006 Lavinia. Uh, and then also I think Leon's drinking a 2001 Canubi Boskis, uh, which is also mm. what what I've got in my glass and it's amazing. So there's some of the vintage that are happening. So um, Barbara, thanks very much. So I, we're gonna, we're just gonna bring Caroline in because I know that, um, that the two of you have met at the winery. Um, hey. and, uh, it's, it's just nice to have that connection. And Caroline, thanks so much for joining us. Um, for those of you that, um, that are watching, I'm sure all of you know who Caroline is. Uh, besides being a friend, she's uh, one of the 
um, the stalwarts of the wine industry. She's got a fantastic um, a couple of wine shops down in the Cape with, uh, with an amazing wine selection. I've always said that uh, it's, it's the, one, of the, one of the great places to sort of walk in if you've got a thirst for fine wine and, and a diverse sort of palate profile. And you'll, you'll walk out, you always walk out there with a fantastic bottle of wine. So Caroline, thanks um, for joining us. And there was obviously a, an additional sort of mo uh, motivation to have you on. And that's your big sort of interest and um, passion for Italian wine and, and specifically Barolo. So I, I don't think I've ever asked you, but where did sort of the, the passion for sort of Italy and Barolo, where did that all come from? Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it was quite unexpected, really. Um, I was working in retail in Johannesburg, in a, and this was 1984. I'm glad I'm sitting down. <laughs> um, and I was invited to go and do the harvest down in Tuscany, um, which I accepted. And um, in early September that year, I found myself driving down from Champagne towards Tuscany. And um, I had made a few appointments and I stopped off in Piemonte and I had a few visits and um, just by chance I happened to um, knock on the door of Angelo Gaia and he answered the bell and I managed to go into that famous courtyard and I had a tour and a, a very short tasting and um, <laughs> subsequent visits followed because I just fell in love with all the wines of um, Piemonte, Dolcetto, Barbera, Nebbiolo. And um, I've been a great collector and stockist of them ever since. And I've drunk many 10, 15, 20 year old bottles. And I'm still very, very, I want to get on a plane tomorrow, Barbara. <laughs> oh, I told you before anyway, please. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to be the only one on, on that flight, you know, so. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I'll wait a while. Anyway, <laughs> after that, I went down to, to Tuscany and spent six months on a, a wine estate there and um, did, tasted hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of bottles. And that's where my love for Sangiovese began as well. Oh, awesome. So Caroline, before obviously all the restrictions that we've currently got, what are you sort of going there generally once a year or every couple of years and is it to, to specific regions or how do you sort of structure your visits? Or um, I can only afford it time-wise, um, not to mention financially these days, um, every second year and then I go to Vin Italy and then afterwards I try and visit um, a region that I've never been to before, but I often land up going back to those that I love the most again. Um, so I've been to Friuli, Venezia Giulia, Francia Corta, uh, Lombardy, Emilia Romagna, um, obviously Tuscany, Piedmont, and um, Sicily as well. And okay. every region's got such magic flavors and I think the pool is that those flavors from those unique grape varieties are so different to what we have in South Africa. And um, many of them are not that expensive. So they really are worth um, trying out for a change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that was actually going to be uh, my next question because I'm interested. I mean, we we let's say are importers and 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 we do what we do use you sort of in a very much a retail environment so i suppose we were i was interested to know what sort of reception you get from south african wine drinkers and wine lovers for, for from an italian wine point of view do you, do you sort of find that it's uh, very much a hand sell or are there particular regions that people gravitate towards that's easy to sell how does it work in the sort of retail space um, it's difficult to get people to experiment when they're spending between 395 and 550, 600 Rand. And I think that that's where the attendance of wine tastings um, has a big effect on their buying pattern. 
because once people have tried something and decided that yes they really like those flavors um, they will experiment more with different brands and different regions but um, when it comes to the great ones um, it all depends on their their buying power um, whether they're collectors or not um, you know buying a really fine barolo or a nebbiolo from Balmaggiore, you you need to know that you're going to be happy to lay it down for five, eight, ten years before enjoying um, that purchase. So, yeah, that's so that's all good. in your merchant is whether it's your company or my company is paramount. I think that's always the interesting one, um, Barbara, with, with Barolo and Caroline will know what I'm talking about when you're starting to, let's say, someone that's maybe just starting out on their wine journey in Italy or specifically Barolo and you um, start telling them that this isn't a wine you should start drinking for the next 15 years or whatever the period is and their eyes roll because they're thirsty and they want to drink some wine. So it does require a bit of that sort of hand-holding to explain that, you know, if you can keep these bottles in your cellar for, for a good amount of time, uh, they can give so much more. And I think that's where your project of the, the older releases are very, is very exciting and it makes a lot of sense because specifically for restaurants, when they don't have that ability to buy something with a bit of age on, a lot of the, the nuance of these great wines can be lost if they're drinking a Barolo that's very young. Even though you can enjoy it, it's maybe not at its, at its optimum sort of drinking level, if you know what I mean. I think that's why it's wonderful to have the Sandrone range, where you can enjoy the Dolcetto and the Barbera um, earlier on whilst you wait for your, your Barolos to mature. Yeah. And, and Barbara, the interesting thing is we've had quite a lot of uh, yeah. clients specifically in the last six months, um, coincidentally, that have, that have been opening up some of the Dolcettos and the Barberas that they've bought from us, um, where they are eight, 10, 12 years old, and the wines have been really, really good. And uh, it's interesting because you think Dolcetto, two, three years, Barbera, maybe five, eight years, but the wines, they can really, um, they can really hold over a long period of time, even just for the, in, uh, the, the drinking wines. Yeah. No, I, um, yeah, well, that's uh, what I normally suggest, but I love also to do some uh, tests. That's why every year at the winery, we hold back, uh, you know, uh, 60, maybe 90 bottles of uh, Old Dolcetto. And uh, to keep there and see how the wine is uh, developing, moving. And uh, well, I have to say, probably is mostly sort of Italian palate uh, to um, get this uh, shot, I don't know what to say, of fruitiness and freshness. So as, uh, for example, we have so many uh, customers from Germany. And uh, their habit is uh, really to hold back also a little bit longer the dolcetto, uh, no doubt with Barbera. Barbera, you know, because of the acidity of this wine, uh, is going to, let me say, age forever, maybe not. But I think you know, we've maybe just lost it temporarily. Caroline, when were you when were you at Sandroni? How long ago was that? I've just calculated it when I was looking at that timeline of Barbara's. Um, I think it was around two thousand and one or two. Okay, amazing. <laughs> Time flies. It doesn't feel that the winery was very new when I went. Oh, well, I think it was ninety nine. So then you went for a, a long eight hour lunch with. Barbara? No, we didn't do a lunch that day. I think we had another appointment at two or something, something awful. <laughs> you know, you've usually got to pack them in when you're traveling around there. It's sort of, um, I think people often think that it's a holiday. I mean, it's really fantastic, um, exciting work. And I think that's why we do it. 
but um, you've got to sort of pack those visits in and, and capitalize on the trip, you know. There is no time for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you've got to speak the lunch in, just maybe, maybe not the eight hour version. Um, <laughs> Christopher, you well, you obviously just in the background there, just trying to get Barbara back. Yeah, that's all good. Uh, Caroline, what um, in terms of vintages, what is, what is, what is sort of the are you sort of on the six fifteens, sixteens in terms of the producers that you work with, or where are you at with vintages? Um, I must be honest, I haven't imported since twenty fifteen. Okay. When we imported the 2011, um, and it, it actually took so long to sell that, um, because I imported a lot, a, a, a lot, um, yeah. that I decided to rather just take the pressure off and, um, and give it a break for a while. And I was busy planning a nice big new order um, at the moment, and that's now been put on hold again. Are you sure you don't want to pay 20 rand to the euro? I mean, it's cheap. <laughs> well, the last time was, I think, 16 rand. Um, and now, yeah, yeah it, it, I think it went over 21 for a while. And I just thought, oh, good idea that I, good, good decision to give it a break. Yeah, no, it's going to be going to be an interesting road ahead. We'll have to see. Uh, Barbara, have we got you back? Yes. Oh, welcome. We, 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 we thought that you had that you had just had enough of us South Africans and you no, wanted to go. Not at all, you know. I almost had a heart attack when I saw the dream coming back. I saw my life was going on. Everything was working perfectly. No, it's it's anyway. all it's all good. Barbara, so, um yeah. And, and Caroline, please jump in if you do have anything for Barbara. I've just got a few questions that I'm interested in um, now that we've got this opportunity. Um, we were, Wayne and I, uh, who's listening in, uh, Wayne says, yes. Wayne and Venetia say hello to you. I know that oh, they're watching. Okay. Thanks. Um, Bye. We, we had a, an, a good conversation earlier just around, not necessarily Sandroni, but more Barolo as a region, because I think, all of our friends and customers who uh, love wine like we do and buy wine and collect wine, uh, Barolo is the one region that um, is, is really sort of bubbling under in terms of becoming the, uh, let's say, the next big thing, even though it's already a big thing. Um, but it's a, it's a region with, with history uh, that, that makes wines with extreme quality with the right producers and they wines with longevity. So that's all those factors that often put a region at the front of becoming something really special, whether like a Bordeaux or a Burgundy. So uh, what, what is your sort of feeling in terms of where Barolo is in terms of um, becoming the next big thing and pricing and what, what is your sort of, uh, I suppose your, what, what do you, what, what do you want to see happen? <laughs> well, you know, I'd like the moon when I say that. <laughs> I'd like to have everything. No, well, you know, um, but uh, we last, I mean, years, 2018, we were able to celebrate our 14th anniversary. And 40 years, uh, it's a long period of time. And I have to say that uh, I've seen so many things changing. And, uh, and also how close more and more uh, you know, new customers came to Barolo. That uh, was really amazing. Thinking of uh, my dad was young and uh, <clears throat> working also for Giacomo Borgogno. Nobody wanted to buy Barolo. They were just looking for Dolcetto, maybe some Barbera. And the Barolo was really the wine for some special occasion and so on. I've decided that the approach has changed a lot and uh, Carolo continue to stay highly demanded. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, we don't have to sleep on that. As, um, we have to work hard in order to improve the quality of, uh, of those wines, but simply, you know, working 
consciously more and more in the vineyard. So the time that, for example, um, my uncle spent in the, in the vineyards with his team is, is amazing. Uh, right now we have uh, 12 people working with us, plus uh, uh, of course we have some other groups or workers uh, joining us during the springtime and mostly during the harvest. As the only working close to something, getting in touch, knowing from each other, you can only improve at the end uh, the final result. Uh, talking about how popular the Barolo has became, uh, that is something that makes me think uh, a bit as um, probably because Barolo, uh, the region is became part of the UNESCO. Uh, so this uh, was a fact of, um, of bringing to everybody attention uh, the fact that Barolo is a site to, to be visited, uh, or to be, yeah, to be visited. And, um, and I have seen uh, coming lots of tourists uh, in the region. Uh, the region has uh, organized also itself uh, in order to welcome uh, huge amounts of people. Uh, and uh, I have to say that I hope that too much popularity is not going to change uh, the beauty of this region. Um, the fact that, uh, as you were saying, there's so much history, traditions, uh, and we don't have to forget that, first of all. Uh, I hope that, you know, um, it's not becoming too commercial, but it's going to remain uh, the corner of paradise uh, that I used to know. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's, it's very special, and uh, I, I had a a friend that was um, that was watching today, and he he hasn't been to Piedmont yet, but he's read enough about it and he's drunk the wines and he says he's very worried that if he goes there one day, he's not going to return back to South Africa to see his wife. He's just going to stay. So I, I think it is a it's a region that is blessed with amazing scenery. The food is incredible. The wines are incredible, and it's. It's one of the, the jewels of the, of the wine world. So it sort of does make sense that there's a huge increase in popularity. And I think from a, a merchant's point of view and a customer point of view, I suppose the only um, hope is that uh, whatever uh, increase in popularity, it happens at a, at, a, at a sensible rate so that everyone can continue drinking the wines and being exposed to uh, lovely families like yourself and, and visiting and things like that. So I think that would be perfect if it happens like that. Yeah, exactly. This is going to be the perfection of, uh, of everything. But um, uh, no, well, uh, you know, as uh, Caroline was saying anyway, she approached the region step by step. Uh, so sometimes uh, what I hear is that it's cool drinking Barolo. But I think that before getting in there, yeah, I mean, you need to approach that level step by step. So first of all, it's important to really come to the region in order to understand the different peculiarities and mm -hmm. uh, in terms also of um, uh, macroclimate because one village is different to another one, one site is different to another one. And also to really talk to the winemakers in order to understand their philosophy because there's not a, a book, a recipe, uh, a cooking book where Barolo must be done in this way. It's really depending on, on the producer's approach and philosophy and feeling. So in somehow in uh, all our wines, we also express uh, our personality. So that's the beauty of the thing. Um, Barbara, thanks. Uh, I think that we, we've, we've just, um, I think Penny, is Penny there? I think she might have a question. No, it's okay. I've, I've been answered, thank you. You've been answered, okay, perfect. <laughs> Caroline, I think you, you had a question for Barbara. 
Um, what percentage of growers are biodynamic or organic? Uh, well, uh, precisely, honestly, I don't know. I have to, to check as well, and I will, <laughs> because uh, it could be interesting. Um, I think that uh, in the region there are some, uh, yeah, of course, some biodynamic, uh, uh, biodynamic sorry, producers, but not many, as many as in other regions. The reason is uh, simply because the region has always been into farmers, and uh, and that is an important fact. Um, fact is, uh, you know, when uh, when you work your own lands and when you have uh, and you were born in a specific area and you have the responsibility of the region where you're living to, uh, people working with you, at the end uh, you treat your uh, crop as, uh, as your kids anyway. Uh, uh, we don't have so much need to, to be green uh, in order to be different. That's the philosophy of uh, farming Very, let me say, extremely green. Um, we are also part of this project called uh, Canoe Bio, as the entire Canoe Hill is, uh, is managed or farm um, following, um, how can I say, a precise procedures. Uh, but honestly, we haven't changed that much for what we used to before anyway, because we always uh, uh, treated our points with copper and sulfur. And uh, right now, supported by 12 people working directly into the fields, uh, you know, they, they act like supervisors. They go around and check in, double check in when it's time to spray, when it's not. So mm -hmm. I think the percentage compared to other regions is very, very little, very, very small. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Barbara. Barbara, I'm just looking, I'm looking at the time um, and I yeah. maybe just, just to be conscious of everyone, I maybe had one, one last question, if you wouldn't mind yes. before we maybe no, no, uh, say, say goodbye and finish our bottles. Um, I'm very interested to know what your, what your view is there's obviously there's been a big um, a big project in Barolo with uh, designating specific uh, vineyards um, and trying to build the I think the brand of specific vineyards. Uh, what is it called the the M MGA, um, MGA, which are those spe MGA, yeah, yes, specific yes. Um, vineyard yes. sites? Do you, in your view do you think that that's something since they started it's Till now, do you think it's been successful, and do you think that it's going to continue to be successful? Oh, absolutely. We were so much uh, in need to have uh, uh, official reorganization of the subregions, as uh, we always before that we always used the word "crew" to identify a specific uh, piece of land, you know. But crew uh, is not an Italian word. Uh, so I'm glad that uh, years ago they went through this uh, majestic reorganization. Uh, we lost uh, some, uh, some regions, some plots, uh, um, like for example, you know, they, they wanted to reunite it, uh, Busia in a sole huge piece of uh, land. Busia in the past was uh, the Sotana and Sotana, I mean the highest part and the lowest part. You know, sometimes uh, you, you have to achieve some compromises, but uh, in general, I think it was uh, absolutely essential as a uh, work to be done. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, it's just been very interesting to watch how that project unfolded um, with a lot of similarities to, to Burgundy, and I think for the right reasons, yeah. which is trying to identify really special pieces of land and end up farming those pieces of land to put something special in a bottle for someone to drink. So I think it's, it's exactly. been, and it's probably never going to be perfect, very much the same as Burgundy, 
where there's maybe bits of pieces of land which maybe shouldn't be classified. But overall, I think the concept does make sense and it's quite, it's going to be fascinating to see how it develops uh, over the years. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we started later or later, but at the end we made it. <laughs> so, and I see no, right brilliant. now also other regions anyway, also for example, California or Tuscany uh, doing the same anyway, because it's extremely important to uh, bring value to uh, all these uh, vineyards. Yeah. Well, Barbara, I'm I'm going to um, I'm going to leave it there and um, just yeah. say a very very big thank you for for the time and the the effort that you put into the presentation and to no, speak no, to, to you. and customers. <laughs> and um, I'm hoping that the next time we see you, it will be at the winery. And, yeah, we can uh, also pitch each other. <laughs> <laughs> and we. We've, we're looking forward to receiving the next vintage when we're allowed to transport wine again. And yeah. uh, also Amazing. a big thank you to, to Caroline for joining us and obviously everyone else that joined in. I know we've, we've lost a few people who've probably got to cook some supper and look after kids and things like that, but it's been great. Yeah. Uh, and thanks to everyone for bearing with us with a few of the sort of the technical um, stalling during the time. And hopefully you can, we'll see you for the next one. And Barbara, please send our love to the rest of the family. Uh, have a nice vlog oh, tonight. And um, I will. Thank Caroline, thanks very much. Appreciate it. Oh, thanks you all, anyway. Thank you. Way. Thanks, Caroline. Have a good Christine, evening. Derek, Wayne, everybody, for doing, making our wine so, so special. All the best. Ciao. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot. <laughs>